Harrison Butker, great to see you again. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing, Colin? I'm doing really well. First of all, I have to ask you about this. What's going on here? Do you realize that's growing on your chin? or <laughs> The wife really likes it, so I've been growing it out a little bit more. I had one for the 2021 season and then 2022. I've just been growing it out. A lot of work to keep it kind of this trim and looking this good? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. You just got to keep it hydrated, conditioned, some beard oil. Do you want it for the 30 minutes we just talk about your beard? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> How are you feeling today? Good, good. Uh, I feel really good. Obviously, we finished the season on the highest note you can finish the season. And now I'm really excited to have more time now with my wife, with my beautiful children, and really be as present as I can be as a husband and a father. But are you still on that high? Like, where, where is your head at the moment? The biggest high, you know, a lot of people would think, oh, the game-winning kick, which definitely was an amazing moment. That's something that you dream about as a kicker, to have the game-winning kick in the Super Bowl. But the, the parade we had a couple days after that was, was unreal. We had a parade, obviously, after Super Bowl 54, which was uh, mind-blowing. But then this parade, I felt like there was even more fans, and you could see how many Kansas City fans just live and breathe football and how you succeeding on the field can bring so much joy to so many people. But what's it like, that moment, Super Bowl championship, you're standing there, you're about to take the, the kick that is going to decide the game. Like, what's that pressure like? What's that feeling like in your head? A lot of pressure. You know, I'm not going to lie and act like I'm a robot and say I, I was not nervous at <laughs> yeah. all. Obviously, I was nervous, but one thing that's helped me throughout my career is taking a deep breath, praying is something I always do on the sideline to remember that, yes, football is so important, but it's not the most important thing. I need to calm down. Number one, it's good to realize I'm a child of God. You know, think about my life outside of this world. Think about my beautiful wife, my children, and then think about the talent that God has given me. And I have this opportunity on this massive stage to glorify Him. Me thinking about the what ifs, if I miss this, if I make that, make the kick, that's not gonna help me succeed and glorify Him. So I try to just kind of get in my own bubble. I go over to the kicking net. I go through some mental cues. I envision what I want the kick to look like. Do you say anything before your, your boot hits it? Like, God, here we go, or? Not right before, but on the sideline, a lot of times I'm just praying Hail Marys, especially if the, the defense is on the field. That's when I kind of you know, <laughs> detach as much as I can from the game. But as soon as the offense gets the ball, I'm up. I'm thinking about kicking as much as possible. But normally I will say a quick Hail Mary when I'm running onto the field. And whether God wants me to make it, whether he wants me to miss it, I want his will to be done because his plan is always going to be better than mine. And that's something that I definitely saw this season through all the ups and downs. I mean, you say that, but you don't want his plan to be that you miss the, the kick at the end and you lose the Super Bowl for the Kansas City Chiefs, do you? Right. You know, that would be awful. And earlier in my career, you say, you know, I want God's will to be done, mm. but you want to succeed and you want to make all the kicks and selfishly, pridefully, I do want to make all the kicks, but if I went through my whole career and made all my kicks and never failed, that could be really dangerous for me becoming a saint, growing in virtue and getting to heaven ultimately. So I definitely want his will to be done. And at the end of the day, God has given everyone so many talents that we can use to be great, great saints that later down the line, centuries later, there's other Catholics that are saying, hey, I wanna be like that person. I wanna be a saint and that's the most important thing and that's why I'm here on this earth. And that's interesting you say that because the, the sweetness of the success, even in that uh, Super Bowl game, when you miss that kick, were you thinking then, did it kind of put you off your game or put you on the back foot? It's always tough missing a kick. And when I miss that kick, you can't help but think, if I only had made that kick, we'd have three more points. We would have gone up in the game. When I got to the second half, the fourth quarter, I'm thinking about the three points that I left out there on the field. But I had to remind myself, this is all part of God's plan. I think I did everything you know, that week leading up to do my best during the game. I'm locked in doing everything I know how to, to perform well, and the kick didn't go in for whatever reason. And it is so beautiful looking back now, if I would have made that kick, I probably wouldn't have had the game winning kick in the Super Bowl. And now I had this opportunity, this platform to glorify God and give all the glory to Jesus Christ, which is amazing. Because for anyone who didn't see the game, maybe in other parts of the world, it was so neck and neck. I mean, this was down to the wire between you guys and the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, I mean, could go down as one of the best. 
Super Bowls ever played just with the amount of points that were scored, how tight it was, 10 point deficit going into halftime. And then we came back and it was kind of a shootout there. And then I think any game that ends on a game winning field goal is, you know, that's a nail biter, right? Because there are games where the kicker misses it, games when the kicker makes it. And it's just a blessing to be in this position and to be able to have helped my team succeed. When it went over that moment, what went through your mind? There's still eight seconds on the clock or whatever it was, but I, I made it. Well, going into the kick, I knew there's still some time yeah. on the clock, but I made it. And again, selfishly, I was so thankful that that went through, but I immediately thought, wow, this is such a beautiful plan that God had in store from week one, getting injured, missing four games, coming back, missing some big kicks for the first time really in my career, but understanding that this suffering is a way for me to grow in virtue, to grow in my faith. And I felt like I, you know, I battled through, I had to grow closer to him, rely on him more than I probably ever had before in my life. And then you have the AFC championship game with a game winning kick and then go to the Super Bowl and you miss a kick and you're thinking, all right, maybe this plan is for us to lose and this field goal would have been the difference maker, but I missed it. But we, we came back and had another opportunity and thankfully we made it. So it's just so beautiful. And I, I always want to harp on the fact that God's will, God's plan is way better than any plan that we could ever think of. Is that what you put it down to overcoming and dealing with adversity and challenges? Like even you said your injury, how do you stay strong willed as a fighter? You know, when you're facing all those challenges. It's tough. And I do want to say that just because you might not be having success, that suffering is still a gift and it's a blessing. And even if I had missed that game winning kick, say I missed the kick earlier in the game and then I missed the game winning kick, this season would still have been such a blessing because I was able to grow so much and I needed that. I needed to grow in humility. And I think we should always accept that suffering and understand that there's a reason why we're receiving this suffering. God's not gonna give us suffering that we can't handle. We can always overcome it, we can grow, and we can learn to accept that suffering and unite it with Christ's suffering. It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? See suffering as a, as a gift from God. Oh, completely. And that's why we need good role models to look up to. We need good priests, we need holy lay people, we need to look at the saints. These are our role models, not, athletes like myself, you could say, or actors or any of these people. I mean, maybe one day, God willing, I'll be a saint. We should all be striving to be saints. And we need to look at saints as our examples, not in most secular celebrities. When someone wins the Super Bowl, you would expect that they maybe go to Vegas and they party on, or they go to Disneyland, as a lot of the players say. We are sitting here today recording this interview in Orange County, California, in St. Michael's Abbey. Why are you here in an Abbey just after winning the Super Bowl? Again, like I said earlier, I'm so excited for the off season to be able to grow in my relationship with my wife and my children, but most importantly, with our Lord. I feel like the off season is the time where I can break away from football that I've been playing for seven months out of the year, and I can really grow closer to our Lord and kind of get a game plan for the next five months of my life, the rest of the off season, how, to, how I can be a saint, how I can be a great father and a great husband. So it's definitely been a priority for me to grow as much as I can with the free time that I do have. Because we can, we can all go party and make all great memories, but if that's not gonna glorify God, if that's not gonna get us closer to sainthood, then you know, why are we doing it? That's awesome. And when we met four years ago now, and time flies, we uh, interviewed you in your house in, in Kansas and you had one child then. Now you have... Two children with a third on the way. Congratulations. Yeah, glory to God. We've, we've really re realized how every life is such a blessing. It's a gift from God. And we are so excited to now have a third child, God willing, in, in the next couple of weeks. So it's that soon and you have a boy and a girl at the moment and you're expecting... It'll be a surprise. Surprise. Yeah, all of our children have been surprises, obviously, until they were born. And we're... But it's incredible, Harrison, because so much has changed since we last met. 
um, you hadn't won a Super Bowl, then you'd come, I think, one uh, one game away from a Super Bowl champion, and you were longing for that. Uh, you've been in three Super Bowls since then. You've won two of them. You've just done the winning kick on the last one a few days ago, and now you have a third kid on the way. Um, like, how are you feeling in, in, in fatherhood and in life in general? I feel like life is moving so fast. I'm not just making kicks so that I can uh, make money and I can you know, puff myself up as this great person that people you know, wanna be like one day. I'm making kicks because God wants me to have a platform, at least for right now, to share this message of, of faith, of growing in virtue, of growing close to, closer to the sacraments and of being a saint. And I'm so passionate about that. And I know whenever God wants me to be quiet and go off and be forgotten, He'll, he'll have that in store and, and I'm ready for that. But right now he has me here and I'm, I'm so grateful and I'm just trying to do my best to take advantage of the talents that he's given me. How do you stay grounded when you have all the trappings of success? Like you mentioned there, the incredible money that comes in the profession, the game you're in, with the cameras, with the attention, with all the glory. There's so many things that could distract you and tempt you. Do you find that? Do you feel those temptations? Completely. I think number one, it starts with prayer. If you're able to sit down, if you're praying a rosary, if you're going to mass, if you're doing mental prayer, and you're meditating on the lives of our Lord, on the life of you know a great saint, you start to realize how you are nothing, how you are ashes, you're dust, and everything that you have, all the talents that you have are given to you by God, and everything that you do that is that brings merit is just from God's grace. And so when you realize that, if someone tells you how great you are in your job, if someone wants an autograph, that's just because God gave me this talent for whatever reason and people love it. I don't you know, allow it to get to my head. When we last spoke as well, I think it was the first time you really publicly spoke about your faith and your belief in God. And if I remember correctly, you were maybe a little bit apprehensive about how it would be perceived, what people would think. We filmed some beautiful images of you serving at mass and so on. Um, what kind of feedback did you get and what kind of reaction from people when you went so public talking about your, your faith? All the reactions that I got were, were really good. Obviously from Catholics, they really loved the video and from non-Catholics, they would you know, potentially search my name on YouTube and then it, it comes What's out this? that yeah, Harrison's got prayer hands and he's in a cassock and he's serving at mass and they click on the video and they watch it. And I think that's been a beautiful video for a lot of people to understand, um, you know, how important the faith is to me, how beautiful the faith is and how we all need to search for truth and find the church. So again, I'm using my talents as best as I can to get that message out there. Any negative reactions to it or pushback? Because when you think of something like the NFL, you imagine that it's very macho, there's a kind of atmosphere there where you wouldn't be doing the kind of thing that you were doing. No, I actually haven't gotten any negative feedback to my face at least from teammates or coaches from the video. It's all been positive, but I don't, I don't look at social media, but there might be some stuff on there, I'm sure, uh, that's not too favorable. Do you not look at social media at all? I don't. I started that in maybe 2020, not looking at social media. I found that it was taking time away from being present with my wife, with my children, taking time away from prayer. And it's so easy to fall into that temptation of you know, accepting all of these accolades and all of these positive attributes that people give to you and you think you're, you're way more than you actually are. So you're listening to all these people tell you how great you are, but then when you fail, you don't wanna to listen to it. So why are you listening to it when it's positive? I don't wanna to listen to it either way. And I keep, the people that are closest to me are the people that I listen to, um, that I wanna hear from and whose opinions matter to me. And the most important opinion is God and I always wanna make sure I'm, I'm pleasing Him and glorifying him, number one, above anyone else. Yeah, you can see how it would be a very addictive and comforting thing when you're sitting there at home. It's just a, a mundane, normal day, and all you have to do is take your phone out, and you'll have thousands of comments telling you how great you are and all that. Tempting thing to, to take and get that dopamine hit, isn't it? Completely. And I don't think that's a, a great thing for us to be doing. I think we, especially everyone in our society, everyone should be growing in humility and I guess that was a source of temptation for me to grow in pride, to grow in vanity. And I've just felt like I've grown a lot closer 
to God by not looking at, at it at all. And people can have social media and handle that, but for me, at least right now, it's just not, not the best thing for me to be looking at. But how do you get your fix of cat videos and dogs on skateboards and... <laughs> YouTube. You gotta YouTube. go to YouTube, you can find everything you need to there. <laughs> You, you are a man who stands up for what he believes in and you stick to your guns. I'm thinking of, you know, the vaccines, you refuse to be vaccinated. Uh, abortion, you've been outspoken uh, strongly against abortion. Um, how do you stay strong in your conviction when, like I said, said it, it does go so much against the grain? Number one, you have to have a prayer life where you're constantly reminding yourself what would Jesus do? What would this great saint do? How can I please God? What would glorify him no matter the cost? So that's number one. But also, especially for men, it's so important for them to have other men around them that are gonna challenge them and that are gonna push them. And so often, if you're a man and you isolate yourself, how do you, how do you push yourself? How do you know that this is a hill I wanna die on or this is something that I can pass along? You always should be working with you know, your group of guys, however big that may be, to push you and to realize that we have to be leaders and sometimes that means fighting for something where you might potentially lose something, where someone's gonna be saying something bad about you. Do you ever worry about it? Because we live in such a cancel culture now, especially here in the United States. And when you're at such a high level, there are people waiting and wanting to take you down from that level. So when, for example, like, uh, refusing to get vaccinated or being against uh, abortion. Uh, would you ever worry about the kind of cancel culture, the ramifications that you could face? Of course, and that's when you have to be prudent and you have to decide what issues am I gonna speak on? What issues am I not gonna speak on? And for me, being pro-life and fighting against the atrocities that occur all around the world, especially in America, with murdering unborn children. That's something that I'm never gonna compromise on. And if I get canceled for that, then so be it. Was there any point where you were getting negative feedback to that, those views? You get it on social media, but again, I'm not looking at that. And actually I had a lot of teammates that came up to me and really respected the fact that I came out and I spoke on it because it is such a taboo subject. It's very controversial, but we're talking about- It's taboo to be against it. It's taboo to be to against, be against abortion, it, yeah, correct. publicly, especially in a, in a career like yours. Right, but how do you look at myself and you see that I served a lot in mass, you see that I'm Catholic, it would only make sense that I'm pro-life. So, you know, it's kind of intuitive there. It's not a shocker. Right, not a shocker. <laughs> here, yeah. I must ask you as well, Harrison, how has your faith changed over the years? So let's say since we last met four years ago, how has your faith changed? When we first met in Kansas, I was serving the mass, the traditional Latin mass all the time, and I loved doing it, but I only had a, a young baby boy at the time. Now with two children, third on the way, I've been in the pews a lot more, I haven't been serving, and I've really started to embrace my vocation more as a husband, as a father, and that's really been something that I've tried to focus in on to be better because, well, before I, I, I had just become a father, right? And now I have two children, third on the way, and I'm trying to find role models that I can look up to that are gonna guide me into kind of how to do that best. Do you ever have moments of doubt? Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't wanna be a complete fraud up here. I don't wanna say the, the wrong things. I wanna make sure that I'm being used for good and, and not for... But not just about your, your vocation or your role, but I mean about the faith. Do you ever... Oh, doubt the faith? Yeah. Oh. oh do you want me to be honest? Or yeah, be honest, of course. Yeah. I do have doubts, but I have to remind myself of all the times in my life when I have trusted in God and how He's worked so beautifully in my life. So I'm seeing just the fruits of following His way, of following His commandments, of living a life that's in line with the way that he wants us to live. I've just seen so much fruit from that. And I, it's just so beautiful to me. And it is easy to say, oh, that, all that stuff, that's not real and to turn your back on God. But at the end of the day, we're meant for so much more. We're, we're meant for being eternally happy with him. And that path does not lead to happiness. Harrison, what's next? <laughs> what's next? After the retreat? I'm just thinking, since we spoke again, 
you have conquered so much, you have achieved so much, what is next for Harrison Butker? I have no clue, that's a great question, but I'm gonna take it one day at a time. I'm gonna be the best man I possibly can be. I'm gonna to try to know, love, and serve God every moment of my life, and God will figure out the rest. What's your slogan? Reach for the heights? To the heights. To, to the, the heights. heights, yes. To the heights. Yes, um, obviously we wanna be saints. It's great for me if I kick the ball super high, and we want to always be excellent, magnanimous in everything that we do. Humble, but we also have to be great. And I think that's going to lead to sainthood. Harrison, I want to thank you. And I want to thank your beard as well. Thank you very much. My beard thanks you. <laughs> thank you, Colm. I appreciate it.